My today guest is the coach Norm Nick Richardson. Hello, coach. How you doing? How's everything? Good to see Very you. Very good. And how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm enjoying this uh, little time we got off for the All-Star weekend. And we're about to start our second half of the season in a couple of days. So just trying to get some rest with the family. When you look at the All-Star game, do you got the same uh, feelings like Coach Malone? Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're really, really similar to Coach Malone. Um, you know, obviously we were hoping for, you know, as a fan of the game, you just hope for a more competitive game, right, to see the best players go at it. But uh, that's how it has been for quite some time. So, uh, you know, we just got to try to find a way to get it back competitive. When I look at the, the game, I then was one thing in my mind that defense wasn't uh, wasn't part of this game for sure. No, no, there was no defense. I don't think there was an emphasis on defense at all. Um, I think they shot 126 three point shots in that game. So it was it was just a, like I think Jalen Brown said it best. It was a glorified layup line, and I totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. For sure, sure, this All Star weekend was something what was really important in the schedule for the NBA family and also for the fans. But uh, I guess that uh, 60 uh, Michael Jordan um, Bears Day was also something really special, especially for your organization. Did the team got a chance to say Happy Birthday to him? No, we didn't. Unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to personally wish him a happy birthday. Um, I think I think he was out and I think he was had a party in Florida or wherever he was. But uh, we didn't get a chance to see him. His um, his birthday fell during the All Star weekend, and everybody was going their own separate ways. But uh, obviously, we see him. We'll wish him a happy belated birthday. We hope he enjoyed himself. Uh, you know, we obviously love our owner. I think he's uh, you know obviously one of the better one of maybe the best player to ever play the game and. You know, I'm, I'm I'm just happy to be able to work for him. So when we are talking about MJ, and uh, I'm just curious if I ask you the question, who was your favorite player when you were a kid, would be the same answer. Yes, MJ. MJ was uh, it was all of our favorites. We all looked up to MJ. Him and Magic Johnson were my two favorite guys uh, when I was growing up, and I remember they were playing in the finals in '91 against one another. I didn't know who to who to cheer for. Uh, so yeah, MJ is definitely my. Uh, you know, my, my childhood idol when it comes to NBA guys. And also uh, your first game in the NBA uh, when you were uh, playing in the Indiana Pacers was against uh, Washington Wizards and MJ was in, in the roster. What was the feeling that you were playing uh, against your the best player uh, from the childhood? I, I mean, I didn't expect to play. I didn't expect to get in the game. I was just, just excited to see him play. And uh, when they called my name to check in the game and Isaiah Thomas was the coach and he told me that I was guarding Michael Jordan when I got in the game. I mean, it was like no better feeling in the world. Um, you know, I was excited. I was nervous. Um, when he walked towards me, I like stared him up and down just because I wanted to see how big he was. Uh, you know, just, I just seen him on TV for so many years and just idolizing him to get a chance to touch him and see him in person was a, uh, was one of my, you know, highlights of my my basketball career. And I was very lucky and fortunate to be in that situation. And you as a person who uh, who was born and uh, grew up in the Brooklyn, uh, in the RE, our basketball is something uh, really important. And uh, there are great players, great courts, street courts. Uh, how it was, uh, and I guess that each day, each game was really tough uh, lesson and many of talented players just disappear from, uh, from let's say, scouts' notebook because they don't have enough uh, opportunity to, uh, to make the, to face the pressure which was on the court. So how it was to learn the basketball? It was, you know, I was, I was lucky to have an older brother that played, my older brother, Derek, was a very good basketball player. He played Division One basketball and also played professionally uh, overseas. And he kind of helped me transition into, you know, to the basketball game and teach me how to play. And I was from a neighborhood in Brooklyn, a small neighborhood called Coney Island, which was very, very famous um, in New York City for his basketball talent. Um, Stephon Marbury come from that neighborhood, Sebastian Telfair, Lance Stevenson, Isaiah Whitehead, Chris Tabb. Um, Quincy Doobie, so many NBA players come from that neighborhood that, uh, you know, we that's all we really did as kids were go out and play basketball. 
So we really didn't feel the pressure because we, we were playing against that every single day amongst each other. So whenever we had an opportunity to play elsewhere against other people, I think us playing against one another in that neighborhood kind of prepared us, uh, you know, growing up. And like I said, I had an older brother that I really, that really gave me a lot of uh, knowledge and taught me how to, how to deal with a lot of stuff on the basketball floor. And it was, it was, a, it was good to see those guys ahead of us, before us in that neighborhood and, and have an older brother to help me understand how to deal with the pressures um, coming up in Brooklyn, playing in the competitive area. Dave Cadell has a chance to, to play in the basketball Mecca, New York Mecca, Rucker, or the Rucker Park. Yes, I did. Yes, I played. I didn't play much in that in, in the Rucker Park, but I did play a few games in Rucker Park um, coming up. Um, Rucker is always in Harlem, so I, I, I wasn't really big on traveling to, you know, to Harlem during the summer. I just I wanted to stay in Brooklyn and play in local tournaments around my neighborhood. But the, the, two, the two or three times that I did go and play at Rucker Park, it was an amazing experience. Um, obviously, it, so many great players had the opportunity to touch that park and, and leave an, an imprint um, you know, on that park. So to have that chance to, to play in that park and just knowing the history of street ball and all the legends that came through that park, it was a great feeling. I'm happy I can say that I experienced it uh, once or twice in my life. I guess that 2001 was also a very special year for you because uh, you've got the chance to receive the Haggerty Award, which is uh, named the best player from the New York uh, area. And uh, a lot of uh, future or in the past NBA players like Mark Jackson, Jeff Ruland, uh, or Quincy Doby, which you mentioned, uh, also got this award. And it was also second year in the row when Hofstra uh, player received this honor because Speedy Claxton was uh, a year before. So was it one of the top three moments in your life when we are talking about this uh, award? Well, it was a special moment for sure. Um, it, it was just a special moment just because, you know, like you said, Speedy Claxton won it the previous year. And to have... Uh, another person from Hofstra University, which is a mid-major program, went it over guys who was at Seton Hall and St. John's and Rutgers, all, you know, programs that are high major. You know, it was a great feeling. I was very excited to, to uh, win that award. I was happy. I was proud to get that accomplishment. Um, and, you know, I, was, I, I can't tell you that it was one of the top three time um, um, experience in my basketball career, but it was definitely – one of the best feelings I've had and one of the most important awards that I've won uh, throughout my, my basketball career, just because of, you know, like I said, being able to beat out players from those high major schools and joining, you know, one of my close friends, Speed Claxton, winning that award was a, was a tremendous feeling. So in the same year was NBA draft, uh, but you were, were undrafted. Uh, so how is this feeling uh, that you that there is a first round, second round, and uh, Commissioner Stern haven't hadn't uh, say your name? Disappointed? You know what? For me, I wasn't really disappointed because I didn't expect to get drafted. I think everyone around me was more disappointed than I was. I didn't expect to get drafted. I knew that you know talking to Jay Wright, who was my coach at college at the time, he always told me that it probably would be better. If I went undrafted, then they go dra then they get drafted in the second round because now I can choose what team I want to play with during the summer league and have a better opportunity to make a team. So when I didn't get undrafted, I wasn't as disappointed as as most maybe thought I was, and as disappointed as my family was. I just thought that okay, now I get a chance to uh, pick a team that I want to play with, and now try to prove myself during the summer league that I belong on an NBA roster. And fortunately, I was able to do that. Mm -hmm. So I get that you were more, more motivated and also got these uh, emotions and passion to show the, those scouts and other teams that you are worthy to be in the NBA. And finally, you found a team. Uh, so, uh, but how looks the beginnings? Uh, because I guess that when you are drafted by a team, uh, it's different than when you sign after the summer league. So, like, how looks... Uh, this first games for Mouse being a as a, being as a rookie in the team. 
Yeah. So how it starts, how it starts off is your agent contacts you and, you know, they tell you what teams are interested in. The Pacers was one of the teams that was interested. So I went to play with them during the summer league. And first I had to make the summer league team. That was the first step um, in, 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 in me joining the Indiana Pacers as a roster player. I made the summer league team and I had a chance to to play uh, during the summer. I think we had six or seven games and I played well during that summer. And right after the summer league, they decided to sign me to a contract. So now I'm officially a part of the Indiana Pacers roster. And going into uh, the training camp, you know, I didn't know what to expect. This is my first time, you know, going into an NBA training camp. I'm playing for a legendary guy in Isaiah Thomas, who I've seen play as a kid and I looked up to as well, you know, and see him beat up my, you know, my, my Chicago Bulls and New York Knicks when I was coming up. And, um, and then, and then also playing with Reggie Miller, who's another, you know, legend in, in Hall of Fame of the, in the NBA. So I was very anxious. I was excited, nervous. I had all these different emotions going into training camp. And I would, I would say one thing, the veterans on that team really made me feel at home. They really made all the younger guys feel that they were a part of something big and they didn't separate the, the you know, the young guys from the older guys. So that kind of helped my transition once I got to the paces. Um, training camp was very intense, very competitive. And I was able to, uh, you know, learn from some really good players ahead of me that prepared me to have a, you know, have a career moving forward at the professional level. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, you, you've got the chance to play one season uh, in the NBA with two teams. Uh, where are some, uh, where is the pressure, the emotions, but when you compare it to the summer league, because many times, of course, there are rookies or sophomores, but I guess that most of the players are just waiting and fighting for the chance to be uh, in the team. So there is, a, I guess, somehow the fight for the ball to show, to, to score so many points and rebounds. So does the stats, the main factor to receive the potential contract from the NBA team or just playing basketball? You know what? It's, it's all about fit and timing. You know, for me, I just was at the right time, at the right place, and I fit what the Pacers wanted at the time. Um, and I think that goes for a lot of people that's in my position, right? An undrafted free agent that, you know, that's trying to prove that he's able to play in the NBA. You have to find the right place to play so you can get the opportunity to show that you belong. And I think it does... It's, not a matter of how many points you score or, you know, or, or anything like that. I think it's just if they, if you fit what they're looking for. And for me, I fit what the Pacers were looking for. They wanted a, a, a guard who, who can shoot the ball a bit, who can handle a bit, who can play some defense. And, you know, I fit that mode at the time. And that's what gave me the advantage over some guys who probably scored more than me during that summer league. And, And again, I was awarded with uh, with the contract moving forward. So I think that's the most important thing: just knowing where to go, and what what needs that team have, and do you provide that, uh, you know, to give you opportunity to make that roster. And next season, 2002 and uh, 2003, uh, you decided to go overseas and play in the Italy. So was it the best offer on the desk or maybe the, there was also some uh, offers from the other NBA teams? Well, I had a chance to go with Chicago. I had a chance to go, you know, back with them uh, on a non-guaranteed contract. And, you know, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to take the chance to go into camp and potentially get cut and then be behind going over to Europe. You know, I wanted to start in training camp with my, with the team that was going to play within Europe and, At the time, Pesaro Scavellini was a very good program in Italy, and and they they offered me a, a good contract, and I thought it was the best contract. I always was interested in playing in Italy if I had to play in Europe, so it was a place that I wanted to be, and so I signed with I signed with them to play overseas. I was young, I didn't know what to expect, uh, very nervous, you know, going to a totally different culture. It took me some time to get adjusted to to living in Europe full time. But, uh, you know, that was a very good learning experience for me moving forward and helped me later on in my basketball career. Uh, recently, I talked with uh, Jason Thompson uh, in my podcast and uh, because he started his career in the Sacramento Kings, uh, which struggled with, with the winning. 
and uh, it, I was really curious about uh, how it was to be in the team which have got the problems uh, with winning because usually when you are in the NBA you've got experience as a star or one of the main uh, players in the team and also winning in something which is in your CV. So uh, I guess that also uh, playing overseas and you travel the whole over the world, but also got the chance to, to play and also be uh, one of the crucial in the roster. And uh, did you try to come back to the NBA or were the offers during this 2002-2010 period? It was. I did try to go back. I, I actually played in the Summer League of 2003. I played with the Milwaukee Bucks and I played very well. Um, and I think George Carl was a coach of the Milwaukee Bucks at that time. And he was still a coach during the Summer League. So I played well enough that they were going to offer me uh, a partial guaranteed contract to come to Milwaukee. And he he got fired like two days after the Summer League and it kind of changed the entire dynamics of that opportunity. So I wound up not going to Milwaukee and I went out to Portland. And again, it goes back to that fit, you know, and being in the right place at the right time. The Portland opportunity just wasn't a good fit for me and it wasn't the right place at the right time when I went there. And, and it just didn't work out um, with the NBA um, during that time. So I wound up going overseas to Serbia and, you know, and it was, it was, you know, on from there, but I did try to get back in the NBA a few times and just didn't um, materialize for me. And also, I guess that uh, playing overseas, there is a chance to travel all over the world and to see other cultures, other countries. You've got uh, Venezuela in your CV, three games in Argentina, Serbia, as you mentioned, uh, France, Germany, and also Poland. Uh, how do you remember time spent in Poland? Because it's quite cold, I guess, for you. <laughs> it is cold. It was very cold, but it was it was one of my most memorable experiences. I just had a very, very, very good time in Poland. And maybe because before going to Poland, I didn't know what to expect. I was I was extremely nervous. Um, I, I never heard much about Poland from anybody that I know who played there. So when I got there, I didn't know how that, how, you know, how the city would be, how people would embrace us. And, uh, when I got there, it was, it was, it was, they, they embraced me with open arms and being in Warsaw, which was a amazing city, a great city, one of the better cities, I'm, I think in Poland, in my opinion, from, from my travels there, I just had such a good time. We had some really good teammates. Actually, I still speak to some of those guys to this day. You know, we still stay in contact with one another. And it was a very, 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 very good experience for me. And sometimes I look at old pictures of my time in Poland and I, and I miss it. I had a teammate of mine named Tyrone Riley, who was a part of that, that mm -hmm. team also. And me and him, sometimes we reminisce about our time in Poland. And we we had a very good time, and it's one of my one of my most memorable experiences for sure. So, what uh, Polish words do you remember when I say "dzień dobry" at the beginning? You know how to behave, but other words, I can't remember anything else. It's been almost you know I haven't been in Poland since two thousand and eight. It's been like it's fifteen years since I've been. That's a long time. I didn't even realize that, and uh, I can't remember anything. Actually, when I went to Germany and played in Germany, I learned the language pretty much i was learning the language and i was getting become becoming good at it and now i can't speak any of it because i don't speak it anymore it just <laughs> just lose it you know and it's a very unfortunate so uh, you how or, or maybe other way when you decided to uh to still be close to the basketball and be a coach because uh, you were in the age when still you could be a veteran and playing uh playing professional basketball, but you decided to uh, be part of coaching staff, first in the Germany, then uh, G League. So I guess that basketball was still something which you don't want to hang in the locker room and say goodbye. You know what? I, I was, I was my last year in Bremerhaven, I was out that year. I got hurt the previous year in Trier. I was, I sat out for three months and then I got to Bremerhaven late because I was recovering from my injury. And when I got to Bremerhof, and it's just, you know, I just didn't feel that same spark playing anymore. I just didn't, I just didn't, just didn't have it in me anymore to play. I, just, I was tired of, you know, all the training and all the training camps and practices. I just wanted to give my body a rest and give my mind a rest. And, and be, to be honest, 
you know, spending nine, eight or nine straight years outside of the, the U.S. during the winter, I was missing my family. So I wanted to, you know, stay home. And I just say, you know, I decided to take a year off and uh, stay home. And, and, and then I finally, you know, I, I knew someone in Germany who helped me, who introduced me to someone over in Germany to help me get the coaching job in Germany. And, and that's when I decided to get into coaching. I always knew I, like at the end of my year, my career, playing career, I knew I wanted to get into coaching. I started to get that feel for it just because I started seeing basketball from like a different lenses. And um, and I and I started to get that itch and I knew I wanted to be around a game. So I took a year off and I really missed it. And I was able to get back coaching mm -hmm. starting in Germany. So uh, as a player who who've got a professional overseas career and also was a coach in the Germany, then in G League. Uh, is it, from your perspective, where is easier for the player to fight for the contract in the NBA? To be in the G League, which is really close uh, to, to the NBA, or better to going overseas, become a star or some really crucial player for the league? And then be be ready for a call from the scout or uh, agent. Which way is easier, or maybe that there is not so easy to describe it. I think everybody's uh, everybody's path is unique. You know, some some people can go overseas and really play well and, and get the opportunity to come back in the NBA. Some people can't. Some people need to just stay in the G League. It depends on your style of play. It depends on where you land at that particular time. Do you fit what that organization is looking for? So it's a, it's a number of factors, in my opinion, that that play into that. And I, I, I can't say, you know, one definite way, it, you know, or one e the easiest way to make it to the NBA just because everybody's, everybody's uh, path to get there is pretty unique. I mean, and I, I'm a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I've got some questions uh, regarding uh, Charlotte Hornets, and yeah. uh, I'm really curious, uh, especially that last season, 21-22, uh, was really pretty good. Uh, you lost with Hawks in um, play-in, but it was really close to be in the playoff. And uh, this season is totally different due to injuries, some of the court uh, issues, and so on. So... Uh, how looks uh, the, mo uh, the situation with motivation in the locker room? Because from the winning team, suddenly become the team who is looking at uh, the horizon for the victor Van Bayama, I guess. Yeah, well, well you know, our, our, our morale has been really good considering our record, right? We all have an idea why we struggled this year, just because we had, like you said, a, a lot of injuries, some off the court issues that you know, that we, that we had to deal with um, or issues, I should say, we had to deal with. And, and then we have, uh, you know, so we kind of have an understanding of why, you know, we, we haven't been as successful this year as we have in the past. Um, but I, I would say this, uh, Steve Clifford has done a phenomenal job at keeping everybody engaged and everybody uh, motivated to come to work. Um, I think we have a great group of players in the locker room that are all – young and excited and love to play the game and love to learn the game. And this, I think the staff has done a good job of teaching the game and, and really helping them um, stay engaged. So I think there's a collective effort. Um, our front office have been very supportive of us as well. So, you know, the, the organization in, its, in, in, in a whole have been really, really supportive of us this season and kind of understanding of, you know, why we are struggling this year. And, um, you know, this is a very, it's a, it's, it's a, unfortunate situation where you don't want to be in that situation, but we are, and we just got to continue to try to get better and build on it moving forward. And also, uh, it's, I guess, not easy season for uh, Lamelo Ball. Uh, last year, he was an all, he, he was in All-Star game. Uh, when we look at his stats, it's developed and are better uh, when we look at totals and even per, per 36 minutes. And uh, due to injury, as I mentioned, uh, he cannot be where he was a, a year ago. But uh, on which aspects he works to to be sure that in the near future he will be regular participant of All Star Game? He works on it all. He works on his entire game. 
I mean, he's, you know, he's in the gym. He, he's, uh, he's a worker. He wants to get better. Um, he's very, 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 very easy to coach. You can challenge him, and he wants to be challenged. So he's always in the gym. He loves to play. Um, if you if you know anything about him, he's a you know he's a he's a guy who loves to be on the court and he loves to play. Um, he take care of his body. So like you know his injuries this year was very unfortunate. It was all ankle sprains, right? And there's nothing you could really do about that. Um, but uh, he's been working his his butt off just to just to continue to improve and get better. And I think. Uh, you know, we have we have yet to see the best of him. He's going to be one of the better players in this league for many years to come, and and is due just to his work ethic and his mindset. Mm -hmm. When we look at uh, this season, uh, which player surprised you in the positive way the most? Uh, I wouldn't say surprise, but which players I was most uh, who I who I was most impressed with this year for for our team is probably Jalen McDaniels. Before we traded him, Jalen was very he was he, he played great for us. Uh, I thought he came in. He he looked great in the summer. He shot the ball really well in the summer and kind of translated over to uh, you know to the season. So he had a very very good season for us this year, um, and I was very very happy for him to see him have some success because I see how hard he was working. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess that it's maybe too early to talk about the next season, but uh, do you've got some draft of the plans for the next year playoffs? First round or even higher? I mean, I mean that's what we hope for, right? We all hope to 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 get to the playoffs. Uh, that's like the uh, pinnacle of the NBA to get a chance to get in the playoffs and compete at that level. So uh, I would love to be a part of a playoff team next year, and and hopefully we can be, you know, we can be right there knocking on the door, getting in the playoffs, and giving ourselves a chance to make some noise. So that's something that I'm I'm definitely praying for. I'm hoping that we have that opportunity. And I think if we can stay healthy and continue to build upon our roster, you know, we'll give ourselves a chance, but that's down the road, of course. Mm -hmm. I, at the beginning, when we are talking about Haggerty Award, ask, is it the, the top three moment from your uh, car, uh, professional basketball career? Uh, so what is your top three, if you've got the best moments? My best moments, uh, one is when I made my varsity team as a freshman in high school. Um, that was that really helped build my confidence. Uh, making a varsity team as a freshman in high school wasn't very easy, especially at the school that I attended. It was a very good school, very competitive with some really good players, and I was able to to play varsity basketball for years. So that was that was the first huge moment for me. My second one was signing my contract into the NBA. Uh, I think that – actually, that was my third one. I'm going to skip one. And my second one was getting to the NCAA tournament at Hofstra University. I mean, that was that was like a dream come true. I always wanted to get a chance to play in the NCAA tournament. And to, to have that chance to play in the tournament was was fantastic. And obviously, signing my contract into the NBA was third. Mm -hmm. So those are three my three biggest moments in basketball. And also uh, at, at the end of uh, each episode, I ask the question about uh, all-time uh, player teammates team. So if you could create all-time uh, Norm Richardson uh, teammates team, who would you pick? If it's too difficult, it could be first by pure talent and second, just the relation which you've got. Okay, my all-time Norman Richardson team, who would I go with? So my point guard would, be, would probably be Speedy Claxton. He'll be my point guard. I'll pick him first. I got another Hofstra guy I would like to pick too as my shooting guard, and that'd be Jay Hernandez. I'll play the I'll play the third guard, a small forward. That would be a part of my team. Can I be on the team as well? Of course, it's okay. your team. team. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So I'll be the small forward. Uh, my power forward, I will go with uh, Jermaine O'Neal, who I played with with the Indiana Pacers, who was uh, a phenomenal teammate, and great player. And my fifth guy would be Tyson Chandler, who I played with in um in Chicago with the Chicago Bulls. That would be my my five players that I'll pick of uh, if I had to pick pick a team. So uh, also when you uh, look at the young players, maybe not all, not only those selected uh, for your team and who are in the league, uh, what kind of advice? Uh, with your coaching experience, you would give to the young, talented players 
to get the successful professional basketball. Just the NBA must be as at the top of the peak of the of this dream, or it's just the cherry on the cake, which could appear, but it's not the most impo so important like the cake. You know what? It, it all depends on what their dreams are. I never want to take away from someone's dream. So if their dream is to make it to the NBA, and I mean, it's 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 in my opinion, it's the best job you can have in the world. I mean, it's the best league in, in my opinion. I just I love the league and you know how the league you know take care of its players and its staff. It's it's a phenomenal league to to be a part of. It's a small fraternity that everybody you know everybody is connected. And I think if that's their dream and their goal is to get to the NBA, my advice is, is to try to get there by any means. And it's going to take a lot of sacrifice. It's going to take a lot of time, um, you know, working on your craft and studying your craft. And hopefully you have that opportunity to get there. But the thing about, you know, think about with players, the only way to get in the NBA is not through playing. There's so many other avenues you can get to the NBA. You can be a coach. You can be a front office guy. You can be a, an official so there's a lot of different ways to get into the NBA if you want to be a part of this this game. And I think my advice would be, you know, whatever it is or whatever niche you can find, you got to attack that with all your might. And hopefully, you know, you get an opportunity to get there. Norm Richardson was my guest. Coach, thank you very much for the time that you uh, give for, our, uh, for, for me and also for... Uh, the readers and uh, the persons who like uh, the podcast support stories from the NBA. So it was really nice to have got you here in my podcast. So I, what can I say at the end of the conversation? Dziękuję. Another Polish word. Okay, dziękuję. I can't remember that Polish word, but uh, I'm assuming it's, is it... Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. That's yes, what it's it thank you. Okay, thank yes. you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so thank, thank you, very you very much again. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So much. Okay. Enjoy the day. Goodbye. Okay, bye-bye.